Now we'll go over how do we communicate. We've answered this question in part through the weeks, looking at photography and videography and other ways that archaeologists communicate. But today I'm going to be looking a little bit more at social media and digital text. In the readings for today, Chiara Bonacci writes about different ways that we communicate through digital media to the public. Now she separates them into broadcasting and participatory means. Broadcasting is something that you might normally see, so sending out tweets and updates about activity or even television broadcasts, anything you don't really necessarily expect an answer for. Uploading images or creating databases of information like the Archaeology Data Service. Or, but there's really big questions about reuse. So how do people, do people actually go to these databases and reuse this information? Do they go and try to find the images and incorporate them into new creative pieces of art? And there's also podcast, again, television, websites, etc. And for example, there's a podcast, the a History of the World and Hundred Objects, which was extremely popular. And sometimes this kind of media is very well received, but sometimes it is good to try to do a more participatory approach. This can be contributory, collaborative, co-created. Um, so, such as crowdsourcing and crowdfunding like Micropass and Dig Ventures, and engaged social media use such as Must Farm and the Museum of Rural Life. Now, this is a, a social media use that tries to actually get responses and draw responses from the users, or it responds to them in other ways through polls or through co creative workshops, getting together with a the community and trying to understand their needs in understanding archaeology, especially locally. Now first going into crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. So this is Dig Ventures. Dig Ventures is a highly successful venture that uh, allows participation in archaeological sites through a, a number of different methods. It crowdfunds, and so these are people trying to get money to excavate these sites, and they use volunteers, but also people can pay to participate in the archaeological excavation. And they are, there's Micropass, on the other hand, which is crowdsourced. So these are projects usually such as transcriptions. They put a lot of archives online and they rely on people, interested volunteers, to go through and tag or label or otherwise apply text or um, do some corrections to diaries. I tried to do one um, from Petrie's diary, and it was fairly easy to transcribe, but some of the handwriting can be incredibly difficult, so beyond our current capabilities for automatic text recognition. There's also writing digitally and digital writing. As Brian Fagan states, digital media are natural for archaeologists who have long wanted to move away from linear storylines. Digital media allows us to tell the stories about the past in a non-linear format. And though increasingly people have been trying to understand storytelling and narrative within archaeology, we often like to go back and let people choose their own adventure as they navigate the past. Some early examples of this include um, a, very, a dissertation written by Cornelius Holtorf in 1998, and so he allowed people to navigate through his dissertation as they liked, skipping between different chapters. This is some fairly early use of academic hypertext, and hypertext seems very normal to us now, a very um, easy and transparent way to navigate text, but when it first happened it was actually kind of a big deal to be able to click on a word and go to someplace else in the text. Another early example of this is Sister Stories. This was an experimental um, archaeological story done in hypertext. And we'll go through a little bit of it here. As you see, it's no longer live. You're on a web archive, and so you can begin. 
and it brings you to the first page. And so you see here, this is some text describing this picture. The scribe writings, Inker has special skills, a craftsman, an artist, a user of black paint, a drawer with black paint, a painter who dissolves colors, grinds pigments, uses color. And you can go through any of these things to navigate these Aztec uh, texts that they've found. And as you see, since it is archived, it is a bit broken, but you can you get the picture, you can navigate through this and try to form your own understanding of this archaeological evidence. Another more recent example is Buried, um, which was done by Tara Copplestone, who is a gifted maker of games. And you can click there. Unfortunately, this one is also offline. But she created this in Twine, which is one of the options that you can use for your summative. And you can refer back to the lecture in week two to understand more about Twine. Okay, so Buried, you click here to begin. And it takes you into the narrative. So you're an archaeologist returning home. And I'll allow you to go through this in your own time. You go to the next. So the narratives deal with um, death and burial of humans. We won't actually get that far, but it, she has a content warning anyway. And then this is a work of fiction. And so to find out more about real archaeology, you go to any of these sources. And then here we go. So this is how we start. It will be presented as digital text with some ASCII graphics, and so you can make a choice to progress through the stories. We personalize, and so we type in um, our first and last name. Let's go in for Nikki Milner. Okay, good. So we can select a title here, probably doctor, though there should be professor, honestly. Select a drink. What does Nikki Milner like to drink? Well, let's let's just say water. Select the location of your fieldwork. It's a bit north of York. And you may start. And then so this takes you through a really nice narrative of how you do archaeological research. Right, so I'll leave the rest of that for you to explore on your own. And again, this is one of the best visualizations I have ever seen that can bring draws from an archaeological database and it shows it in a very graphic fashion. This is the Atlantic slave trade in two minutes as visualized. And each of these very small dots is a ship taking enslaved people to North and South America. And at the bottom, you at the top, you have the year. At the bottom, you have a timeline, and you can scroll through the timeline. And as you see, going through time, it gets larger and larger. And I encourage you just to sit and watch this as the ships go by. But we can pause it. And any one of these dots, you can click on it and see the name of the ship, where it came from, and how many enslaved people that it took. So difference between the people who it took from the Republic of Congo and the people, the total people that it landed with, people dying in the journey. Junon. The Betsy. By 1883, we just see vast, vast amounts of people being transported. Again, a very, very powerful visual interpretation of archaeological or historical data drawn from a database. The monumental past, sister stories, and buried were experiments in hypertext, and I think they're effective in slightly different ways. We still don't really do our big uh, books and our dissertations, our thesis in hypertext, but there may be more capacity for this in the future. 
So we've moved from hypertext into collaborative publication. This is the abstract for a session that I co-organized, as you see, from the for the EAA with my colleagues Kate and Marta. And in this, you can see all of the corrections and who made it, and a little bit more about where the ideas come from. And this would be a very interesting, very transparent way to publish if you could get over all of the annotations. Again, hypertext and digital writing is really mostly taken for granted. It's still a very strange space for much of our academic writing, and academic writing still inhabits a very much a linear, narrative-based approach. And it's hard to tell how do we know if people are reading our stuff anyway, and we'll go into that in a bit. And so it can also be seen as potentially dangerous for participants. Now we'll go into some aspects of perhaps old social media. This is my blog, and it was for a while one of the most famous archaeology blogs, if that can be a bragging point. It was called Middle Savagery. I drew some critiques from its name after a while, which is completely understandable, and changed it to just my name. When you have a blog, you can track visitors, you can track impressions, and see what content is the most popular. I could see, for instance, where much of my traffic was coming from. It was probably unsurprising that it was mostly from the United States, uh, where I was based for the most of the time when I was writing my blog, and the United Kingdom. And you can see that blogs interact well with other social media, with most of my hits coming from Facebook and Twitter. And now, increasingly, it is, it is normal for academic departments, for archaeological units, and for even archaeological sites or research projects to do their, their outreach through Facebook and other online mediums this, for instance, is the University of York's Department of Archaeology page, probably from a two years ago or so. So it's become common for archaeological sites, research projects, universities to have an online presence. It's actually a little bit strange these days when you don't have an online presence. And so this is one of the main ways people find out about your program or what your research project is and how you portray yourself is incredibly important. As I stated, there are also downsides. This is drawing from a paper by Sarah Perry, who found out that social media use can heighten marginalization, reinforce insularity. It produces unequal benefits primarily for institutional players. It cements the status quo. It's very unstable and impermanent. Um, there's also often a lot of data loss associated with social media use. And so there's a lack of evidence for online media's impacts. Hopefully Chris Wakefield's research will be remedying some of that. But it's also a political nightmare, if you haven't noticed. 41% of respondents um, to the survey that she conducted reported inappropriate or uncomfortable online communications in a pro professional context. And so this, um, it was mostly women that received this abuse, and so that there, a very, fairly high percentage of them did not report the abuse, though. This is a breakdown of people who identified as men and women and what category of abuse they identified. And as you see, women received more general bad mouthing, whereas men received more professional attacks. Women received sexual, physical, racist attacks. And uh, while that category is much smaller for men, if you are subject to this kind of abuse through trying to perform your public archaeology or social media outreach. 
it's really important to get in touch with your pastoral supervisor as soon as you possibly can. Document everything. Take screenshots of all of the abuse. And if you are uncomfortable approaching your pastoral supervisor about this, we also have the report and support website where you can report this misconduct. And as you see, it is actually against the rules within York. It, this kind of misconduct falls under bullying. So it can be, as you see, it's, it, bullying can be in person, online, or through any form of communication. So what I hope you've gathered through this part of the lecture is that social media, digital writing, it can be incredibly useful and incredibly powerful for public outreach in archeology, span but there are some downsides and there are some risks, especially for younger women and for younger men.